Hi guys, this is Mr. Vandegrift with the Chaparral Habitat Lesson 1.3, Part B. Part A was the Chaparral Habitat article that you were supposed to read and then annotate that. So I know Mrs. DeMeyer is going over all the details with that article with you in Lesson A. Now I want you to get started with just writing your science journal just for a couple minutes. And I'd like you to write down the word biotic, abiotic, and ecosystems. And give me a definition of each one and maybe an example. So go ahead and pause the video and go ahead and do that. All right, I'm back. So again, hopefully you said biotic would be any living thing found in the environment or that ecosystem. And then anything that is abiotic would be non-living, right? Like whether it's the sun or the wind or the minerals in the soil or water. And then if you put those two together, you come up with an ecosystem, which is a natural system of all plants, animals, and microorganisms, which are the biotic factors, together with all the non-living or the abiotic factors. Putting those together is going to make an ecosystem. So here we have a coral reef ecosystem with the living and the non-living components of the, this marine ecosystem. Or here we have the tropical rainforest. So we've got the living, the plants, the animals, all of that, and then the non-living components of that. Or here would be a desert ecosystem or a hydrothermal vent at the bottom of the ocean ecosystem or a redwood forest ecosystem. Now, I want to pose a question to you. What do you think is the largest ecosystem in the state of California? So go ahead and pause the video, maybe ask some people, maybe ask your fabulous audience at home, what's the largest um, ecosystem in California? Now, when you think of San Diego, it's an amazing place to live. I have literally been to the snow, and on the exact same day, snow up in Julian, on the exact same day, go surfing down in Torrey Pines. So it's just a really got mountains and beaches. You've got salt marshes and freshwater marshes and lagoons and estuaries and grasslands and oak and pine forest and riparian ecosystems and mountains and streams and oak meadows and deserts and shrublands. But what is the largest ecosystem in California? If you said chaparral, then you would be correct. But exactly what is the chaparral? Um, in the 60s, there were these racing team and they had cars called chaparral and that was the name of the team. But chaparral is not a race car. It's not an old school uh, television show called the High Chaparral. It's not some supplement, a uh, health food supplement. It's not even an elementary school. that they, There's some elementary schools named the Chaparral. No, the Chaparral is California's most extensive plant community. Um, it's more than the deserts. It's more than the forests. It's more than our coastlines. It dominates almost every part of California. It's absolutely everywhere. If you don't believe me, if you go up to San Luis Obispo, you're going to see chaparral, or in Malibu Creek, you're going to see chaparral, or Pine Valley in San Diego, you're going to see chaparral, or San Mateo up um, in the Bay Area, you're going to see chaparral, Santa Barbara, chaparral, Torrey Pines, that's going to be your coastal scrub sage, but that's like a soft chaparral as well. You've got San Diego chaparral, you've got Sacramento as chaparral, Point Loma down there has got its own chaparral, Mount Woodson is literally covered in Chaparral. Mount Iron Mountain is covered with uh, Chaparral. So it's absolutely ever Santa Barbara, Chaparral. So if you take a look at the map of California, all of this blue represents Chaparral. And if I'm not mistaken, every single county in the state of California has Chaparral in it. Now, If you look at the data here, you can easily tell that um, Santa Cruz has the least amount of Chaparral. And San Diego has the most, over, over a million acres of chaparral. Los Angeles coming in second place with about a half a million acres of chaparral. So I brought a little in from um, my property right here, some chaparral that I cut off here. I don't know if you can see this. Um, this is California buckwheat, 
And I love the little white flowers that it usually produces here. And then when they die, they turn this rust color. Really cool. But just take, make some observations here. Okay? So first, listen carefully. Okay? So we've got these shrubs, right? It's just, Some people say it's called the elfin forest because everything's really kind of small. It's not too many trees. You can see these tiny little leaves. They're green, but they're small. They're woody stem shrubs. You can hear it like that. And many of the leaves are kind of waxy here. Take a look. I got stuff all over my keyboard. So the... Uh, California buckwheat you can find all over Ramona. You can find it in the Estates, Mount Woodson, Iron Mountain. And then right here, take a look at this is probably the most dominant plant in the chaparral. It's called chemise, or some people call it greasewood because it does go up pretty quick um, in wildfires. But if you look really close, you can see these small little green leaves. And then in the spring, it is this beautiful, really cool white flower that blooms. Actually, um, I've got some here that I got from my property. See that beautiful white flower. So this one's called chemise. Again, listen. So it's got that woody stem. All right, and a big part of how these plants have adapted to this dry, arid environment, we're going to be learning more about in next lesson. But I just wanted to bring um, a couple of the plants so you could take a look at them. Now, Chaparral, we already know it's a plant community, but it's dominated by these woody, right? These woody, drought-hardy shrubs, and it's shaped by a Mediterranean-type climate. That just basically means that in the summer, there's very little water, drought conditions, and then in the fall and winter, there's not much rain. There's a lot of heat and then infrequent wildfires. That's, um, And we also have the California sage scrub, which is often referred to as the soft chaparral on the coast. So you can see here that from California all the way up to Oregon and all the way down into Baja, California, we have, and a couple places in Arizona, we have chaparral. And then when it comes to the world, we have some found very similar uh, conditions like we have in Southern California in central Chile, um, at the right here in West Cape, Western Cape of South Africa, Parts of Australia, Southwest Australia here, and then of course in the Mediterranean Basin right here. So this is pretty much the only places where chaparral is found uh, worldwide. Just some facts, we've already talked about it, the Mediterranean climate, it's mild, the wet winters, but really, really hot summers, and some wildfire. And then um, they're very plant drought tolerant plants with hardy sclerophyllous evergreen leaves. So most of these, even though it's getting very hot out, this, the leaves are still green pretty much throughout the year on a lot of the plants in the chaparral. Um, the sclerophyll is a type of vegetation that has hard leaves and short internodes, the distance between them. And again, you can see that really good on the chemise. I think this might be chemise in the picture there. Okay, really small leaves there. And we'll be learning a lot more about this in our next lesson. So again, we've already gone over a lot of these facts. Well, let's take a look at down here. About 9% of the state of California is covered with chaparral. And the name comes from the Spanish word ch um, chaparro, applied because of the scrub oaks. Now, California chaparral is a biodiversity hotspot. When I was reading up on the chaparral, I was like, blown away that I didn't realize that chaparral, look down here, is considered to be a bio, biodiversity hotspot. And there's, um, you, you think of a tropical rainforest when you think of a biodiversity hotspot, but Southern California has been identified as one of the world's richest biodiversity hotspots by the international conservation community. Much of this diversity is found in a habitat known as the coastal sage scrub, which historically occupied large, large areas of California. But of course, we've built homes on those because it's close to the ocean. Today it's restricted to about only 10% of its former range. So the zoo's been working on a lot of um, stewardship and trying to save large tracts of this land in San Diego County. Um, so you can see this is considered a biological hotspot here. And I want to just play this little video. It's only about one minute. 
60% of the plants in the California Floristic Province are endemics. The amazing diversity of plants brings birds that might spend the most of the year somewhere else here to feed certain times of year or brings them to places like the Farallon Islands to nest certain times of year. So they rely on parts of California for one part of their life cycle, but they're not found only here. It's one of the only hotspots in North America. It's one of the only hotspots in the developed world. You don't have to go to you know, the Philippines or to Madagascar or to a tropical rainforest to experience one of the most diverse places on Earth. Millions of people live in California. It's the center for many, many things, and it's one of the most biodiverse areas in the world. One half of all things that people in the United States eat are grown in California. In California, about 75% of the original habitat that supported those plants has been lost due to agricultural and other modifications by humans. So that's what makes it a biodiversity hotspot that has lots of species and things that are found nowhere else on Earth, and they're under a great threat. So San Diego is a really unique and cool place. And so we've got some really cool endemic species in San Diego and doing the chaparral unit, and we want you to learn more about those. Um, so let's just touch base really quick on some chaparral animals. I'm gonna go really quick. And then later on in the unit, you are going to be getting some um, species cards and you're gonna be learning all about these different plants and animals um, from the chaparral. And then we've got some cool things where you're going to be putting together um, some food chains, food webs, and food pyramids, and then tracking the flow of energy and matter through the different trophic levels. So those will be um, a couple other lessons uh, next week, but I just want to quickly go over some chaparral animals. So gopher snakes. How many of you have seen a gopher snake around your house? So we've got gopher snakes in chaparral. When I was at the private school, Francis Parker, there was a gopher snake right out in the chaparral, right at the school, and uh, we... We returned it back to the chaparral. It came on campus. So you also have the Southern Pacific rattlesnake, the Red Diamond rattlesnake, the Southwestern speckled rattlesnake, and the Sidewinder side winder rattlesnake. Again, you can really tell the difference between the gopher and then the rattlesnake by its head, right? Although gopher snakes will sometimes rattle their, move their tail back and forth in leaves to kind of mimic having a rattle. Uh, king snakes. We found one on our property, about a three-foot king snake. Again, don't kill them. Again, they're very beneficial eating other snakes and sometimes rattlesnakes as well. They can be banded or striped, but again, this is the California king snake. Here you can see one eating uh, a rattlesnake. You can see the end of it. So you can, there's great YouTube videos of watching king snakes eat rattlesnakes. This is my son a few years back. We found a beautiful rosy boa on our property, and there's my daughter Zoe. She's pretty excited. I believe this was 32 inches, just shy of three feet. It's the largest rosy boa that I've ever seen. What was really interesting, though, is I saw these scars. It was like two or three on each side, and it literally looked like some type, like a red-tailed hawk or something grabbed the snake, and its talons penetrated it, and somehow the snake got away and lived, because this is, seems like to be a very old rosy boa. It had a lot of scars, and it was really, really large. Um, and then we've got our alligator lizards. Many of you have seen those. you got to be careful because they will bite and latch on. And our western fenced lizard, or other known as the blue belly lizard. Um, there's the horn lizard. I don't have a picture of that. We've got a California mouse. We've got big-eared wood rats who make these really cool nests in the chaparral. We'll talk about that. Oh, there's a picture. Actually, this one's on my property here. We have a wood rat. And the desert shrew be found in the chaparral, even a mole. They're kind of cool. They really don't have arms, right? They're just, their little hands are like stuck right there. And the Townsend big-eared bat. These guys are great pollinators, but also look pretty fierce when you can see their teeth. Uh, and you got the pocket gophers. And the Cal uh, California ground squirrels. Bush rabbits, striped skunks, possums, um, raccoons, gray foxes. One of my favorite. I've already told my fox story. I thought I saw one today on our property right behind the garage, but it was actually a, a pretty small coyote that was just going through our property quickly just at dusk today. Coyotes, of course. Bobcats, which I've seen in the chaparral and on our property. Mule deer, have not seen. Mountain lions, have not seen. Uh, although there was a picture of one on my neighbor's property about 18 years ago. Got that picture. I should probably show that sometime. And then lastly, of course, is the California grizzly bear. Anyone seen those? I don't think so because 
they're extinct now. They were wiped out. But some estimates say there was about 10,000 California grizzly bears um, in the state of California. Um, again, their California chaparral was their preferred habitat of the California grizzly bear. And they would travel in packs of up to 10 to 20. And the Native American Indians were terrified of them. I mean, who wouldn't be, right? And the grizzly bears would use um, the same trails for generations after generation. And the old growth um, chaparral with a lot of manzanita and bigger, you know, I mean, not too big, but, you know, bigger uh, chaparral plants that grow a long time like, like the manzanita. A um, couple of my friends that have done outdoor education in Julian say they kind of know the locations of some of the old growth chaparral, and that could be possibly where they'd used trails generation after generation. It's pretty cool to think about. The largest grizzly bear ever was recorded in San Diego County. I did not know this, that this grizzly bear in 1866, uh, they estimate was weighing 2,200 pounds, was killed in Valley Center. Back then, it was known as Bear Valley, and then later on, they changed it to Valley Center. So it was in San Diego County. The largest grizzly bear historically ever was um, shot and killed in uh, Valley Center, or it was back then, like I said, Bear Valley. Now again, one of my students was saying, Mr. Randolph, is this a picture of one of them? And they're like, uh, no, I think that's from a Kodiak bear, probably in Alaska or something. Um, and this bear was smaller than this bear here. The average, I think, may, a female grizzly bear is about four or 500 pounds, and the average male is about seven or 800 pounds. So again, twice, this one was just a Goliath of a grizzly bear. And so this is just the biggest paw of a grizzly bear I could find. And obviously, uh, this photo would be in black and white if it was taken in 1866. So the largest grizzly bear ever recorded. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the California grizzly is on our flag. Many people think it's a black or brown bear. And this is actually supposedly uh, modeled by the last grizzly bear that was in um, captivity that died in 1911. I think it was Golden Gate Park Zoo, and uh, this bear's name was Monarch, and they used this to model our California flag. The last grizzly bear um, ever shot in the wild was in 1908. Um, here it is. It says, last grizzly bear, sh bear is shot, steals honey near Santa Ana, and pays the penalty. Santa Ana is basically where Disneyland is up there, so that's pretty cool crazy to think there were grizzly bears roaming around where um, Disneyland is. And then we move from the mammals to um, the arachnids. You've got uh, the California tarantula, we've got ticks, uh, and peps and wasps. This one's really interesting, right? Stings the tarantula and then lays its egg right there as it paralyzes it, and then that egg feeds on the uh, living tarantula, kind of like a living baby bottle, kind of creepy. I had some old videos here of it stinging. Species, show right, so they, they fight it out and then eventually stings the tarantula and drags it down into its um, own hole and Finally, then lays one the egg there. So you can see how diverse with the birds, like roadrunners here, the wrens, uh, the hummingbirds, you've got your kestrel and cooper's hawk, red-shouldered hawk, red-tailed hawk, and our mammals I've talked about here. We'll go into more detail with our food chains. Let's quickly talk about some plants, just briefly. And we're going to get more into detail next class with our plants. But we've got the uh, either the mission manzanita or the big berry manzanita. And these, again, uh, get pretty big, you know, 8, 9, 10 feet, kind of like a small tree. But again, it still is a, a shrub. There's a little close-up on its flowers. And the Ceanothus, or the California um, lilac, right? Beautiful. So in the spring, hillsides are all purple on Iron Mountain or Mount Woodson. You've got the scrub oak. I have those all over our property. Just a smaller uh, oak. And this is kind of what it looks like with a trail going through some scrub oaks here. And this is the daughter vine. It looks like silly string's been sprayed all over. A lot of times it's found on uh, laurel leaf sumac or California buckwheat. It looks like that silly string. Some people call it like witch's hair. Um, we'll go more into this. I'm going to go locate some of this and make some videos for you guys. Here's the chemise I showed you right here. The chemise flower you can see there. Oh, yeah. See all the white flowers there? And there's a close-up. Gorgeous. And the California buckwheat like I was talking about. Wonderful kind of white flower with 
pur purple pink and then it turns this rust color when it it's dead and this is the uh, California Whipple Yucca, uh, Yucca Whipple Eye, I believe the scientific name is, or some used to be called the Our Lord's Candle. You can see them sticking up. There's hundreds all going down Scripps by Parkway now. Uh, beautiful. And we'll talk more about this. You can see my daughter here. I gave her a couple of dollars to eat one of the blooms because they are edible. And there's many uses. You can see my son is not too impressed with her eating that flower. So next class, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be going over and bringing in multiple different uh, chaparral plants, and we're going to be looking for patterns. We're going to be thinking like ecologists, wildlife scientists, and um, looking for patterns here. And here's some leaves here. You'll know what all of these are and all their adaptations and how they survive in the chaparral after the end of that lesson. And so you can see here, we're going to be going over all these, looking at the leaf drawing, the margin, uh, the leaf texture, leaf color, size, and then their adaptation. So I think there's a couple pages of that. Yeah, one or two. And um, I'll be holding them up, talking about that, giving you details, and then I'm going to try to go on location and take some videos of that. So, so I want to leave you with this thought here. It's a quote from Thomas Berger. And it says, The art and science of asking questions is the source of all knowledge. So asking questions like we talked about in our last lesson is so important that you generate your own questions and from those questions, you, you begin to learn. You become a lifelong learner, right? Because your curiosity causes you to ask questions because you're making observations about the natural world around you. And from that, you're wondering and asking questions. You're going to be learning so much more about the chaparral. And the chaparral, again, remember, um, Southern California, it's a biological, uh, biodiverse hotspot. And there's so much going on in there, just even in our own backyard. And hopefully, I want you to be more educated about that and get more excited about getting outdoors and getting into the wild. All right. So hopefully, this lesson um, got you excited. Hopefully, uh, you have read your chaparral handout right here. If you haven't, make sure you read that and annotate it. It's a great article right here. And this is from Richard Halsey, who is a chaparral expert, and he has a great website. I'll put the link down there so you can take a look at that as you're designing your food chain, food web, and uh, food pyramid. All right, so hopefully this lesson was helpful. I will see you in the next lesson. For now, talk to you later.